Well, it's here, so I think we better get started. Yeah. Sorry, Chip and Kimberly. I hope good sentence. Uh, Susanna, welcome. Um, and so, uh, uh, Mary, I was late coming on. You've already um, set us up with live on YouTube, and we're going to continue our discussion on the stimulus equity bill, Susanna. And our committee um, is has some questions that we need to um, to to work through in order to get this bill uh, done and move it. Um, I uh, we we talked about the the um, the definition of residence, and um, we'd like to know if that uh, you know what problems that creates uh, with with any of the um, individuals involved or. Um, definition, you know, with, that we need to be as clear as possible with a definition and, you know, if the one uh, in the language work or if it needs to be tweaked or if, you know, uh, we work from the driver's um, privilege card. Um, and we wanted to talk about the timing and how fast you think that we could get this set up and, um, and getting the money out and the length of time in reality that people would need to fill out the application to come forward and fill out the applications. Um, and so we want to talk about deadlines a bit. And, um, and then there's some other places in language about your involvement in the uh, procedure, in the process, if, um, if we should use a may or a shell with the, the agency, uh, with your involvement and with other groups involved. So now I've just scattered the language everywhere so if Maria, Teresa, if we could bring up the language, I, I think that that would help us move through in sections at a time. And, um, and I know that you had worked on language and if you could share some of your concerns um, with, with things that we're thinking and help guide us, that would be helpful. So let's move down to uh, section um, one, definitions. Uh, so we've talked to Mike O'Grady, and I think committee, we were all set uh, with these definitions, or was there something in within these definitions that we wanted to run by Susanna that Mike was not um, able to, he's going to add some language in the eligible adult that, um, that goes back to the original definition for the $1,200 payment. Um, Maida, do you have a question? Uh, yes. Did we have questions about the definition with regard to eligible child that the year issue? Was that I'll something we had settled already or was No, we not? did not. And Susanna, the problem there is the federal, in, in the federal law, they have under the age of 17. And so we're waiting to find out if it meant 17 year olds were treated as adults or if 17 year olds just happened to be left out. Do you happen to have any, um, was that anything that came to your attention ever? It wasn't actually. I wasn't aware of that um, of that oversight. And I imagine if I had to speculate, and it's so hard to speculate on what Congress means when it says something, but I would imagine they might have meant 17, 17 and under. Right. And I asked that and Mike said no, it was it under was 17 under 17. So I asked and I said, does it include 17 year olds? And he said, no. So that's something that we will, we will tease out. And if you keep that on your radar, um, anything else in the eligible adult or child that we'd like to run by uh, Susanna? Mike was going to cite a piece of the federal law in, in number two. Number three, we'll get clarification on the age. Marty? Dave Iacovone brought up the question of did the child need to be with an yes have a, the eligible adult had to be a parent what if the uh -huh. child was here with an uncle or an aunt as an example not actually their parent and our question I think was how common might that be and I don't know if Susanna has any indication of that or not or whether we're just better off to leave it the child and a parent. Would you like to weigh in on that, Susanna, on number? Yeah. yeah, I would say being as inclusive as possible to make sure that we're serving as many children as needed would be ideal. So 
including language that allows for guardianship and understanding that there are some family structures that maybe guardianship is not as clearly defined in legal terms. Um, but if there's an adult who is effectively the, the caregiver or the guardian for a child who's in Vermont um, and they were excluded from receiving such payment, then I think that just as a matter of, of equitable policy, it would make sense to shape the language in a way that's inclusive of that child. So I wouldn't limit it only to parents. So how would, if we have parent or legal guardian, do you have access to our screen? Are, are you able to see our screen? That yes. is, what, what would you recommend um, that we in, include there? What, what would a recommendation be? I would say um, for whom an eligible adult is a parent or legal guardian, and this is just off the top of, my head and I have not run this past any of our other attorneys yet. Um, so just me spitballing, but we might consider um, we might consider if there's a situation where a child has a guardian and it may not be formally, for whatever reason, it may not be formally final in the law, but they can demonstrate that that child does have a guardian here in Vermont, um, then maybe on a case by case basis, there, there, there could be an opportunity for the state to review any supporting documentation they have and, and, and include that situation. I hope I've explained that cohesively. I, I understand where you're going. And so you need time to develop some language there. And uh, Chip, will you? Will you uh, I'll check in with Mike. Excuse me? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a note to myself to um, ask Mike if, we, if there's a way to do this um, to cover what uh, Susanna is talking about okay. um, in language. Um, so the committee is good with that section and Chip will work on that. Jen. <laughs> yes, I can't see you, Mary, because I have this. Go ahead, Mary. Um, so under eligible adult, it says that they're eligible due to their immigration status. There are people who did not receive a payment, not because of their immigration status, but because they are married to somebody who um, immigrate, whose immigration status prevented them from receiving the benefit. So oh. I wonder if we need to expand that language to make sure that we pick up those other groups of people who are excluded. Mary, I think Mike, uh, Mike commented on that. It's not due to their, it's just due to immigration status. And he said that which should bring in the other groups, I thought, because it was due to immigration status that me as a, maybe as a legal citizen and my husband isn't, due to immigration status, I wasn't able to get it. But it doesn't say it has to be mine. It's did, did anyone else hear Mike say that, or did I just assume he was, does anyone? No, I, I don't know, exactly right. but this was yes. just about the child though, not the. No, I'm on adults now. No, We're on adults. Yeah. Right. The, language, the language that I've been using when discussing this is due to their or someone else's immigration status. And I think Mike said he took those words out because he thought this made it cleaner, but we can we can go back to that and see. I, I'm uh, just, that was Mike's ex explanation. My concern is that a plain reading of this leaves, leaves it open to interpretation. Mm -hmm. And if one wanted to be limiting in one's interpretation, you would not include those other groups of people. So I- Okay, so uh, Chip, we have that to bring to Mike and- um, and he can add it, or if he needs to come back and explain, if I, you know, I, I can't remember exactly, but he he said that this is he did this this way for a reason, but we want to make sure it's not limiting. Okay, I think um, I can't see hands, so and have both up. I don't have hands that I can see, so let's move on to the next section. And, um, Madam. Madam Chair, if I may, I, I do have a, a little bit more clarity on the question of 17-year-olds. Oh, okay, great. So evidently under the CARES Act, 17-year-olds were not eligible for the $500 um, augment for children. 
In fact, I believe no dependent over the age of 17 would qualify a person for the $500 augment. Were they eligible for the 1200? I think if you were a tax, that is unclear still to me. I don't even want to pretend to have an answer. I don't. But I do yeah. know that 17 was the cutoff for mm -hmm. the child um, for the child amount. And when we were figuring our estimates of the Vermont population of eligible children, we took uh, children, I believe, to be people under 18. So including 17 and 18 year olds in Vermont would not add, to my knowledge, would not add anything to the estimates we've already had. Okay, and um, the language before us has under 18 years of age. And Diane, you have a question on this? I, I was just thinking, you know, if I, I think they probably in the federal law, it was like if you were 21 years old and you're still being a, de you're a dependent in that family, you, you didn't get the, the $500. Correct. But if you were 15 and a dependent, they got the, the, the $500. But if you were 17 and a dependent, you did not get it. Correct. Right, or 18 or 21. Right, but 17 year olds, you're not legally an adult. There's really a difference between a 17 and 18 year old. Not to drag it out, but I don't know even if, if you're 21 and you're a dependent or being claimed as a dependent, you couldn't get the 1200 alone either. You got nothing. No, I think anyone who was claimed as a dependent, if that person was eligible for CARES Act funding, then it was, it was received by the person who claimed that person as a dependent on the tax filing. Okay, all right. Okay, so this is, we're going to come back to uh, number three for our first decision, unless you think we can clean it up right now. Uh, can we agree to um, under 18 years old, that 17 and under, or do we have a, a, a is this going to be a long discussion? Because I wanna be uh, sympathetic uh, of Susanna's time spending with our committee. Well, we were gonna hear back from Mike on this issue specifically, and maybe we should wait until we, he comes back with that information. Um, okay. Yes. 17, 18 year old, okay. Okay, let's, Linda, uh, next question. Did you call me? Yep, your hand was up. Okay, I really like I really like what it says right now, under eighteen years. So if you're seven, if you're seventeen years old and and eleven and a half months, you can still get the money. Once you hit that eighteen, then you're not eligible. And I really like that. So that's just my opinion on the. Okay, uh, thank you, Linda. I think um, the the. We'll wait. There was a piece that Mike was going to come back for clarification, and then we'll just take a position as a committee uh, whether we leave it to match the federal or whether we um, move it to um, under 18 years of age. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and now let's, uh, we went down through number four, and Mike spent quite a bit of time on the personally identifiable uh, information, and that this was to outline what types of information would be protected. Um, are you okay, um, um, Susanna, would you like to weigh in on any of these pieces or do you feel um, that number four is okay? I, I know that we had spent some time on concerns of what information might be made public. Yeah, if I could just get a quick scroll through, I can just So it starts with name and Teresa, mm -hmm. down on page two, please. Here we go, and it goes to, uh, here we go. That these would be, these would be protected. Um, we can go up some more because just name is on number one, Teresa. And it goes down to a uh, letter I or sing singularly or alone, any of that information. I think this, yeah, I think this is consistent with, with the, the first draft. It doesn't look like anything's different. So I would say that we're, this would be great. And then we move to um, number five, which is resident of Vermont. And um, Teresa, will you move it up so we can have all of the resident of Vermont um, on the screen? Thank you. Were there questions here for committee members regarding resident of Vermont? 
that we'd like to run by Susanna or Susanna, do you have any concerns you'd like to share with our committee? I don't, I'm, I'm um, and, and I, was it, go, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, re I reviewed it and I am comfortable with this language. Any questions for Susanna, uh, Bob? Yeah. And Mary. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I just read this quickly. Where did it was at? Uh, it, it went on to say, in terms, oh, me, a resident of Vermont means any individual living in Vermont who intends to make the state his or her principal place of domicile, either permanently or for an indefinite number of years. So what does that mean? Intends maybe for permanently and maybe not. I, I don't get that. I, and I'm not saying we need to change it. I don't think it's that important, but it's not. I don't think it's well, I don't um, think it's well written. The, the, um, the, the question was, if you keep going, it, it's those workers who are living here and have been here for quite some period of time the individuals that would not be included in this bill, and we talked about the H-2A uh, and students <clears throat> and uh, people that are just on a contract that have, have sent over to work for a company, uh, would not be included in this in this language. And and so, do we need to do any more to clarify? I, you know, I I. I chase this down really quick because I got the feeling we were leaving it and and I haven't even had a chance to really totally read it and digest it it's not bad so I, I you know I'm gonna ask to move on <laughs> I'm not gonna hold everything up over this but I think it's important that the, that we all come to a common agreement on, on what a resident of Vermont is and and so um, we have clearly stated, which group would not be included, but do we have enough clarity on those who are? So I have Marty and then Diane. Well, I'm just reflecting on Mike's comment that this is a standard definition that was developed when we were talking about driver's privilege cards for persons who were here, not necessarily properly documented as far as the US government is concerned. And I think that's the same group of people that we're talking about now for this economic stimulus program. And that's the definition that's in statute now to refer to that group of people so that they can get driver's privilege cards. And I would think that would be the very same group that we are talking about for this. With the so I, I like using a legal definition that's already in place. Um, so we have um, Diane and Mary. Bob, did you want to comment on that? Thank you for that clarification, Marty. I, I did not remember that it was the definition for uh, the driver's privilege card, but I did uh, write down um, that, um, that um, some committee members mentioned to keep the definition as clear as possible. And if it's already in statute and it's working for the driver's privilege card, it's something for us to consider. Uh, Diane? That was exactly what I was gonna say. Marty and I were on the same page on the same note that this is already and sometimes, and I'll, and I'll be the one that, to issue the warning that you said, if we start messing with already law policy, we might, uh, we might, might need to involve other committees or things, but this, but Marty's right. That's my notes too. It's based on the driver privilege. So that, that definition already exists. We're not creating it. Thank you, Diane. Mary? I don't need to say it again for the third time. Everybody's covered it. I'm uncomfortable, but this is existing law. I would rather end it um, halfway through that sentence. But if it's existing law, let's move on. OK. Uh, any other questions about the resident piece? And I'm going to check that off unless there's questions there. Uh, I'm going to ask Teresa to send you um, you all an email from Mike O'Grady. He is uh, he has weighed in on some of the definitions of a child and uh, the and so if we will bring that up after. But um, 
if we send that out in his email, that would be great, Teresa. Let's move down past the resident. Now we'll move on to page three. And, and uh, Mike's answer may um, answer our question. Teresa, there you go, for the 17-year-old. This is where um, we're, we're going to have to spend a little time about the establishment of the program um, and, and where this program should be run out of. And if we need to um, contract with a third party or if we feel the agency of whichever agency we choose has the capacity to do it. Susanna, when, when you were looking at your original language, um, I think you were using ACCD. We were thinking, uh, or at least I was wondering about the Agency of Human Services because they have put out so many grant programs, um, especially um, revolving the welfare of families and children. And, um, and I, I <coughs> know if, if there was some thinking within the administration that a third party contract was not needed, but you know, definitely to hear from uh, groups to help identify and, and help with the application process so people weren't left behind. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, so I think that in terms of whether it should be done in-house for the third party entity, it would be, and this is a personal preference, but I would really appreciate if there could be permissive language in the bill that allows for the contracting with a third, with a trusted third party entity, if deemed necessary. Um, because I think that that will give us more flexibility. So perhaps not making it uh, mandatory, but rather permissive to say that we may contract with a third party to administer this program. Um, and if that were the case, I, it would be helpful to include a cap on the administrative costs that would be allocated for that third party contract. Okay, thank you. So let's move down past one, two, and three, because I think these have already been established in one, two, and three. And then the program, this is on um, C, where we get um, into this piece. And so Susanna has, has uh, put put forth um, the possibility of including if it's necessary to reach out to a you know to use a third party and to cap which is in this bill but this was a combination of of three different ideas. Um, do we want to talk about? Uh, I'd like to hear from the committee about which agency that you would like to uh, consider to to run this program and um, and your thoughts on allowing for a, a contract if it's deemed necessary. Do committee members have any thoughts on that? Uh, then I'm going to put it on the table. I would like to run it through the Agency of Human Services because it's because of the nature of the group that's being involved, you know, that being considered. I just think it, it, it leans more toward um, uh, the care of, of uh, families and, and children. So is there any opposition? Um, I will check with uh, Mike Smith and Sarah Clark, but is there any opposition from this committee to, to go with the Agency of Human Resources? Mary. No opposition. I cannot think of a better place to put it. Not only do they work with um, marginalized or underserved communities, but they also have access to language resources mm -hmm. and experience in reaching out to communities who may not know how to work within our existing governmental structure. I think it's a great idea. I just, I just want to note that I, I agree I, I, in all of what Mary just said is exactly right. But Kitty, you said Agency of Human Resources, and I think you meant Agency of services. Human Services. And then services, thank you. Um, and then uh, Marty had brought this up earlier, and Susanna, maybe you could um, to, to weigh in here. So in C1, the administration of the program, the program shall be administered, and I think that we have agreed, I haven't heard any opposition for AHS, in consultation um, with um, the Executive Director of Racial, racial Equity. And so the program shall be administered by AHS. Um, I don't know legally if that means they shall consult with you. And, and I mean, so somebody- so shall. 
Well, it says shall be admitted. <sighs> But does the in consultation does that have, is that a shell as well? It must be a shell. From, um, from my yeah. reading, the consultation is also a shell. Okay. And can you talk about um, the importance of of your position um, working with AHS? If we should have a shell or a may there, I believe that there should be a. You mean a shell or a may with respect to consulting with me? Uh, yes, because I I think that the committee. Yeah going to agree that it AHS shall do this. Yes. And um, should we dictate that to AHS? It's not that we're not considering you. Should we dictate that to AHS? If you you know, I, I would leave that to the committee. I can say that whether or not it's required by the statute, I and AHS will eagerly pursue that partnership. Um, actually, I, I ran into the Secre Secretary Smith earlier today, and we chatted briefly about this, and we're both on the same page 100% um, that, that, that I would be honored and pleased to be involved as deeply as possible in the administration of the program. So I leave it up to you to decide whether you make it permissive <laughs> or mandatory, but you should be aware that either way, uh, it'll happen, definitely. It's going to happen. Uh, um, uh, well, um, Yep. I'll just weigh in to say I think we, the the legislature should take the position that the that the um, agency shall or well in this case in consult will work in consultation with the executive director. I, I think that's a policy piece that we I, I would like to take that position on. Okay, and um, so Chip, I'm going to put that on the table, and it, I think it's an easy one that we don't need to dis you know a long discussion unless there's some points that haven't come up, but if if uh, committee members agree to leave the shell there, can I, um, is, if there's any opposition, I'd like to know that, because I don't, if we're in agreement, we don't need to hear that, but is there any opposition for the first piece with AHS and with the executive director's position? Okay, I'm waiting for delays in some of our then, then let's leave the shell there and let's move on to the next piece that the, the agency, no, don't go down too far, that the agency, go back up a little bit, Teresa. Shall, stop right there, the, please. Shall partner with public or private entities uh, as needed. Does the shell, does that need to be a shell or does that, or should that be a may? Let's just clarify these fine points. Kimberly? Yeah, I'm thinking that, um could be a may, um, but I'm raising my hand on a slightly different topic in that same sentence. It gets to Peter's point about trust in a state issued check. I'm wondering if we could add in something along the lines or deliver um, assistance payments of state issued checks to eligible individuals. But I don't know if that's the right language because there may be electronic transfers or whatnot, but that may be a place to land um, what the actual vehicle is. Okay, so, um, so before we move to the state issued checks, I wanna stick with the shell or the may, and then we'll move to the last sentence there with the state issued checks. So Kimberly has put on the table, it could be either way in her mind, it could be a may, what are committee members thinking? Uh, Linda? I'm definitely uh, a May. I, I think that uh, the Human Services Department has the knowledge, the experience, and everything else to do this. If they feel they need help from some other organization or something or other, the May works better than saying that you absolutely will get, will get all done with everything. So I'm a May from the, from the beginning on this one. Thank you. And Susanna, do you have some thoughts you'd like to share with the committee on that? I think that um, may would be perfectly fine. And if it were shall, I think that's still relatively permissive only because it says as needed. So it probably would get us the same result, but I'm very comfortable with may. Um, so then we would take out the as needed because did may. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's a little redundant there. Yeah. So uh, where would the committee like? I know it's a little point, but I want to get this language done. Uh, a shell or a may? Would somebody put um, a recommendation on the table, and we'll take a position on it? I will. Uh, Linda has actually put a position on the table to change it to a may. So, 
uh, if you agree with the may, it's a it's a yes. If you'd like to leave it at shell, it's a no. Um, and I where's uh, yes. Um, so back to the squares. If you agree, just changing it to a may as needed. Uh, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Okay, I we have a majority there. Um, and if you want shell, let me just do the democratic way. I'll take a hand. Okay, we will change that to a may. Thank you, Kimberly. I got that. Uh, if we change it to a may, do we need to take out the word as needed? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Chip, are you taking notes on this? Uh, some. <laughs> Is anyone taking notes on this? We trust Chip. Okay. And then we'll bring it back and we can um, clean it Tell up. Tell him where he was wrong. Susanna, we, took, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the, the delivery of the payments. Um, and we really thought in order to uh, start creating some trust between the state and, 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 other, and others in Vermont that, um, that we wanted a state issued check, not to scare anybody or frighten anybody, but more of a goodwill and to start building this relationship. What, what do you, how do you feel about that? You know, one of the challenges is that the population we're talking about, and we talked about this, I think, yesterday, all the days blur together, but I think it was yesterday. Um, this is a population that is often unbanked. So that's one, um, that's one thing to consider. I don't know if there's an opportunity for us to work with any um, finance institutions on the ground to serve as, I don't want to say safe havens, but um, trusted partners for folks who, who want to present their checks at those institutions. Um, there's also, I mean, it's, it's certainly easier if we can print up checks in house and, and send them out, we can keep track of it much more easily. Um, so perhaps that is a, a good solution. I'm, I'm not sure that there's a great answer here. Uh, Marty. Is a prepaid visa card anything that would make sense? That way, it's not an EBD card for, for just food, but just a prepaid credit card. You know, those debt, those gift cards you buy at the store. We pay. Um, so. No. That, pardon me? We pay for those. I, I think that there's a percent that, you know, the, the, we'd lose money on them. I, well, May yeah, I also that, that would be a consideration. Yeah, it's, a, it's an idea that we should put out there, yes. May I also add that just in the way of trust, uh, I think any kind of a card, whether it's a gift card or EBT or what have you, always bears the, um, always bears the shadow of your spending being able to be tracked. Even if the state of Vermont is not tracking people spending with these cards, I can't imagine why we would or that we would. But um, the perception on the part of the recipient, I think might be uh, that. Also, again, this is a, a population, many of whom operate under the table or in cash or informally. And so issuing these payments in the form of cards might limit their ability to use the funds as nimbly as they might need to. Marty, do you have a follow-up? Uh, we have some uh no just i understand that's an option i mean that that there are difficulties with that but i guess if we don't issue a check because people have difficulty going to a bank and we don't issue a card how else will we get benefits to these people i'm certainly not in favor of handing out a wad of cash um i don't know what might be other options well, I think we can do a check, but um, how they would receive the, where they would receive the check and where they could cash the checks. Is, is that the issue, Susanna? Well, yeah, it, those are two issues that, that I can identify. I think if we're talking about checks, cards, or cash, a check would probably be ideal of those three options. Um, and if we were talking about how they would receive and cash those, then um, 
you know, in terms of receiving them, again, that may be where it comes into play that we work with trusted third party entities who may have the stack of checks physically and we say, okay, go to the office of such and such organization or go to your local health center. Um, I forget what, what is the name for our state health department uh, regional centers, but maybe that means going to one of those because they are the ones who have, or, or something like that. Um, and then on the topic of cashing them, yeah, again, I mean, I wonder if there's some way that we might say, hey, if check cashing places in Vermont, if someone comes in with this particular kind of check, um, maybe limit the, with, you have to limit the fees that you can charge yeah. to them or something like that. Okay, so I have, um, I have uh, Mary Chip and then I have a whole long list and this may be something that uh, we take offline and, and, uh, and some legislators, some members work on it and bring back a proposal to the committee because I think we could stay a couple of hours on how to cash checks. But Mary, if you have an idea, let's put it out there. No, I think we need to take this offline. And there's the question. So there, I think it's a two part question is how do we deliver a payment to the individual? And then how does the individual um, receive the payment in you can't just hand the check. They then we need, then need to think about how they're going to turn that check into cash. So there are two issues there. But rather than speculating it on here, I bet the treasurer's office may have some ideas, and maybe a couple of us could go off and think about that. Um, so I would like to know. I'm not volunteering. Yeah, I have a lot, I have a lot of hands up, so I want to know if. If, um, if with the hands up, Nolan, were you going to weigh in on this piece? Yeah, um, I was just gonna say that uh, given some work I've done with things with DCF, there tends to be some administrative fees sometimes around EBT cards that don't exist around checks. So there could be, I don't know if there is or isn't, but I'm just flagging it. There are different kind of administrative costs to do cards versus paper checks. Thank you, thank you, Nolan. Um, I would like to send this off to a work group, but I, I, if, if uh, Chip, did you want to weigh in quickly? Yeah, um, rather than, um, I mean, given if we had time, I would say, yes, us digging into this and figuring out a solution or possible solutions would make sense. We don't have time. I would recommend that in number two in that section, uh, we, where it says the agency shall adopt requirements, guidelines, and procedures that are necessary to implement and administer the program, I would add something like including providing um, how to provide payments to those who don't have access to banking services or uh, an address, um, you know, something to cover those two um, that leave it to the agency to have a little bit more time and a little bit more uh, access to people who can help figure this out uh, and i will just remind us that they will be working in consultation with um, susanna so the issues that that we're bringing up here the concerns i think will be brought to them as they try to figure out how to do that so we're going to have a work group with chip who will uh, work with legislative council and susanna and with other groups to to develop that language so that it addresses how we deliver the payment and how it can be cash and how it can be equitable. So uh, Peter, and then we'll go to Dave. Peter? Yeah, did you so to I, I just reached out to, to uh, Chris Delia, Bankers <laughs> Association. Um, if individuals, if we issue checks to individuals who have ITINs or are here under a visa or some other type of a, of a government program, then the banks can cash the checks, no issues. Uh, if they are here, let's say under the table, um, then the banks will not be able to cash the check. So I agree with Chip's comment. We're going to need to put something in there to allow for uh, the, the funds that we intend to get to individuals to be able to actually get to them. So Peter, did you just volunteer for that work group on that language? Dear God, I suppose I did. <laughs> thank you. And our, thank you. And Dave? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. I know we're going fast. We don't have a lot of time, but I, I want to try to channel the work of Ruby Payne on Bridges Out of Poverty, who stresses 
how important it is to develop relationships with people to help move them to another place. Yes, this is a program aimed at doing a transaction. You say, are you eligible? And you'll get a check issued to you. And $1,200 is huge. But if our, it, is this an opportunity to do much more than that? Can we work with a population that, that has a lot of needs, children who have language issues, who will at some point be entering our schools, uh, families trying to integrate into the Vermont we know so that they can succeed. If an agency or an organization that AHS contracts out to has the power to cut a check and, and, and hand it to a person, uh, that goes a long ways. And if, the, and if they're trained to say it at the same time, uh, Marty, if you ever have any challenges, feel free to come back here. We'd like to help you and your family. That creates, I think, an enduring um, uh, relationship and an opportunity that will pay many dividends down the road to helping people in, in our country and in our state truly integrate and be successful. If I could think and give Chip uh, a sentence or a sentence and a half to include in the language that might um, enable AHS to think about this or give them the latitude to do something like this, um, would that be okay? I may not be able to. I know um, perhaps, uh, Kitty, Dave, if you said, Dave, you're just moving too far into policy, I understand completely and I'll let it go. Um, it's, it's certainly worth thinking of. And then if it moves too far into policy and expands the bill into something else, we may have to come back in on it. The other thing we may be able to do is attach to the check a list of resources, av available resources that, that they, you know, I don't know if it's a silly idea, but on a card that, you know, educational resources for your kids or, you know, that they could contact, they, they would have contact information they could do on their own. But you think about it, and uh, I could Chip, and bring wrong. it back to the committee. I could be wrong. Maybe. But by maybe you went out, or maybe it's my, maybe I'm unstable. No, I, I stopped talking. <laughs> No, Madam no, Chair. you're not unstable. Um, I just stopped talking. Okay, Susanna. I'm I'm sorry. I know we're moving fast, but I just had to say I'm so grateful for the representative's comment. I think that's spot on. This is one step out of many that we're going to take to build or rebuild trust with this community. And I don't think I could have said it better. Thank you, Representative, for for highlighting that. And and so Dave, work on work on uh, language. Bring it to. And, and we'll bring it to the committee to see if, it, if we're just trying to stay within the lane, Susanna, because we're not the policy committee. Of course, if of course. Not too far, then we're going to trigger a bill that really needs to go to a different committee for full vetting. Um, so, Dave, you're on that. Um, and then uh, the next one, we have about um, eight minutes, and then we have somebody else testifying. Number two. Um, allows that the agency adopt the requirements in the programs. And it also, Linda talked about, it's not going to trigger rulemaking. And I think that we talked about that when Mike went through the bill. So I, are, are, are there questions about not triggering the rulemaking provision? Let's go down to number three. Um, uh, this is utilizing staff and resources. Are there any questions on allowing the, the agency in order to administer it? And then D comes into the contract for implementation, Susanna. And this is where you weighed in that you thought it was important to keep this if it's deemed necessary. Correct. And so Chip, if you could um, add those words, if deemed necessary, I think that's important. Okay, um, before we go um, too much further, I think some of the real key questions that we had um, previously may belong um, up in the section we were just in, and those revolve around whether we set a, um, do we set any kind of a deadline uh, for the program to be stood up? Do we set a deadline for people to apply um, and a time at which the money unspent money would revert to some somewhere. Susanna, could you speak to that, please, when, when you were 
when the administration was putting this proposal together, what the timing issue was knowing that this money needs to go out quickly to help individuals. What did you think reasonable timing was? You had used ACCD, we're using AHS. So it's we're still using a state agency. Could you um, elaborate on some of the discussions maybe? Yeah, so, um, you know, to the points about timing and deadlines for application and um, deadlines for us getting ourselves together, I think that a, a fair deadline for applications, I, I'm thinking about working backwards, which is why I'm starting with that. And I think a, a, a fair deadline for applications to be received could be the end of the calendar year. So about December 30th, December 31st. Um, and so if we work backwards from that, giving the public maybe two months to learn about the program, because that takes time, um, to apply for it and then to supply any other necessary documentation that may be needed. If we give them two months for that, then that would mean that we would have to open applications around October 30. And so I understand that we still have to go through a sort of legislative process. And, and I don't know what, what the timing looks like on that. So if we consider maybe a month, month and a half for us to complete this, and that's just me completely spitballing, I have no idea what will happen here, but um, it, it would be fair to give the agency enough time to stand up this program, to, to figure out whether it needs to contract with outside agencies. And that's gonna take, it's gonna take a little time. So since the bill would move separately, um, depending on how quickly it moved through the Senate and then came back to the House without many changes or with no changes, it could ultimately get to the governor's desk by mid, by mid September. And um, you're thinking that if, that if we gave um, four to six weeks to set up the program, and try to have applications open by the 30th of October, which would allow two months for educational purposes, getting documentation in order, having entities help individuals fill out applications, and then uh, have a deadline for the application on December 30th. That, that is what came out of my mouth, yes. Um, but again, I would, I would check in with uh, AHS because they're much more aware of, of their own capacity. I don't wanna speak on, on their behalf, but, I, but just on the topic of how long do we wait until we assume that the application, you know, how long do we wait to administer this program? I think giving applicants until the end of the year would be fair. And if our, if, if our process ends up dragging on longer than we expect, then I think that we should uh, extend the deadline commensurately. Peter? Peter? So this kind of goes with what I was saying. The, the budget itself is a document that at the end of the budget time, unless we have indicated otherwise, money reverts to the general fund. So that would be my recommendation. I, I, I think that there's going to be a lot of things that that the that the administration is going to have to overcome as they as they find them while they're trying to administer this program, and we need to give them a lot of latitude to be able to maneuver through them. Uh, so to put a to put a fixed time frame by which we're going to revert any funds at the you know maybe our March or April time frame might unnecessarily uh, cause individuals who who would qualify to not be able to receive. I think we just need to leave it flexible as possible um, within this uh, within this budget year. And at the end of the year, 30 June, uh, funds revert back to the general fund, my recommendation. And general fund or back to the fund that right. we may, maybe we take the money from. That there, Correct. There may be yeah. Pressure yes, yeah, back. yeah, that's a good point. Yes. yes. Or back to the chintz fund. That that would happen at the end of the calendar year when all at the end of the fiscal year, yeah, end of the fiscal at, year, thirty June. Fiscal year, yes, thank you. But she's saying a deadline for receiving the applications for them to right. have applications. And, and again, I, I think that we need to be very flexible here because I just we're going to be talking to individuals that that we're going to be trying to build trust with, and you can't do it with one conversation. I would imagine. Um, so let's let's allow individuals on the ground maximum flexibility and latitude to be able to make this work. 
Thank you, Peter. Okay. Um, so we'll look at that December 31st and does it need to be pushed out or does it just need to be flexible? Uh, Mary, and then I think we're going to have to move to our next conversation. Uh, Mary? My interest is in trying to get the money out the door to individuals as quickly as possible. Um, so I don't care about the end date, but I do care about a beginning date. Um, I appreciate I, and re, re, will remind us that we heard from O'Grady that it took ag two months to set up the program and a couple, three weeks to process the applications. So I'm comfortable with, I, I would like to suggest that we set a date of expectations on getting the check out the door because I don't just, I mean, and let's remember how overwhelmed all of these folks are with other work we're giving them. And I don't want January to roll around and hear that they haven't started issuing checks or making these payments available to folks. Um, well, in January, they, if, the, if we had a deadline of December 31st, the payments would, wouldn't start going out until January 1st. If that's the conclusion, I wasn't well, clear on what the deadline that you were talking about was, a deadline to have a program start, to ask, you know, I don't, I'm trying to ask that we set up something that gets payments out the door as quickly as possible and to be realistic in that. Oh, so uh, because I do have somebody else here that I need to be respectful of their time, I, I need um, a work group and I have Peter and Chip um, on the work group. And is there anyone else that would like to join this group to, um, I, I think that we have heard, you know, we, we've heard it above um, earlier of issues that we need to uh, look at regarding the delivery of the payment and and how to cash the check, but now it's also the timing of this piece and how to make it, as Peter said, fair and flexible, um, but also um, that we don't push it out so far that it just doesn't happen. Uh, is there anyone who else wants to join in with Peter and Chip, or are we going to leave that a group of two? Do I see any hands up? I'll help. This is Marty. Okay, okay so I have Peter, Chip, and Marty. and. Um, Susanna, thank you very much for coming in. And I'm sorry we didn't get through this language, but Teresa, if you just scroll up a little bit more from here, uh, the confidentiality piece we've already walked through with Mike O'Grady, unless you have uh, issues there, Susanna, that uh, Chip can address with us and keep going, Teresa. Before you go any farther, um, in D1 contract for implementation, there was, you mentioned something and I, I missed that one a little bit. Susanna had, I no. thought there was some. Oh, uh, uh, contracts as deemed necessary. Or, oh, as de okay. I think that Thanks. that was the, the word that was used there, as deemed necessary. The other thing I think that I had mentioned earlier was putting a cap on the amount okay. of administrative overhead. So I think one draft of this had no more than $50,000 for administrative. Okay. It is, oh, it's on the last there. Problem. Okay, good. Okay. So make sure that that is in your um, in your work, and I'm hoping that you guys will have some time this afternoon to work on this, because we we really need to start shaping it up tomorrow, and making a decision probably on Thursday. I know Chip, you looked at the time, the calendar. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Um, I think we're going to stop here, and if if anyone in the committee uh, has any questions, uh, please. Uh, uh, move those questions on to Chip and Maida, no, Chip and um, Marty and uh, Peter. And Susanna, I, will you be available to also um, to, um, if there's questions that you could answer as this work group works on this language and massages it a little bit? Absolutely. I'm at your service. Thank you. We, uh, we appreciate your help. And I'm sorry if I seem scattered, but I have a hundred billion budget I, things that I'm thinking about at the same time that I'm trying to concentrate really and be focused on an important piece of legislation. I think you're doing it very well, Madam Chair. So no, no apologies needed. Thank you all. Thank you.